we're going to go on to our next speaker, who is Aaron Bergdahl, who is our forest pathologist for the great state of Maine. Just wanted to remind everyone that we are recording this, so it'll be available um, as a recording on our website. So if you missed something or if you didn't understand it, you should be able to listen to the recording on our website. And um, our very own Greg Lord is very good about splitting this in half so you can you don't have to listen to the first half in order to hear the second half. Um, they'll be put in there as separate things. So Aaron, if you want to tell us a little bit about yourself before you get started, that would be really nice. All right, I'll do my best. Um, so my name is Aaron Bergall. I'm the staff pathologist with the Maine Forest Service. I'm I'm the only pathologist with the Maine Forest Service. Um, I've been around a little bit. I did my undergrad in um, University of Vermont in forest biology, and then I did a plant ecology master's degree in, in at the University of Oulu overseas in Finland. Um, then I moved back to the United States after 10 years there and uh, did all my PhD coursework uh, in plant pathology at the University of North Dakota, or sorry, North, North Dakota State University. I'd get in trouble for making that mistake. Um, and uh, then this uh, dream job came up in Maine, so I dropped my PhD and, and came here to, uh, uh, to to work and hopefully stay for a very long time. So I've been here for, I think this is my sixth uh, field season. Um, and uh, so far, so good. Uh, never a dull moment. So with you to do, that's for sure. Oh, yeah, oh, that's for sure. So I'm going to start today by doing a, a presentation on diagnosing tree disorders in Maine. Um, and then due to some uh, recent, very recent developments that some of you may have heard about, uh, I've got a little uh, bonus presentation at the end uh, to share with you uh, some some new, I'll just call it news. I won't call it good or bad news. I'll let you be in suspense, but listening to me and Mike talk, we, you know, you don't hear a lot of good news from, from our shop. So, but anyway, uh, I will get going on diagnosing tree disorders in Maine. So, uh, why are diagnostic skills so important? So th these are really important for professional foresters, uh, extension agents, um, arborists, but they're also, this is all really, also really important information for just people in general, people who pay attention to, uh, to trees, um, you know, people that are observant uh, and notice when things may be a little bit different. And it, diagnostic skills are so important because trees can't talk. They can't say, oh, we feel great. This is the perfect site. There's nothing bothering us. And they can't say, I don't feel so good. I think it's my roots. Uh, there's something wrong here uh, that's uh, causing me not to thrive. So because trees can't talk, we have to get uh, information from landowners because uh, or other people from the area because uh, you know looking at a situation where there's a tree that's not thriving you know we we lack information we don't know how a tree was planted we don't know about any weather conditions that may have happened we don't know about the history of this tree was there some soil compaction in the past was there's a chemical leak was uh, there some kind of uh, damage done to the tree, uh, issues with the soil. And we also don't know about the other types of history, like herbicide use, for example. And one of my favorite uh, things I, I say to myself sometimes when I, I uh, encounter a certain situation, your tree's problem may be you. It may be that you're loving your tree too much or, uh, uh, you know, and, and applying, you know, too many herbicides. Uh, in close proximity to the tree or watering a little bit too much or pruning it too hard because you want it to look just right. So, uh, you know, having a, comp uh, having a complete suite of information along with the situation can uh, get you a long way. So always be asking yourself questions, be asking the landowner questions, trying to be figure you're trying to figure out as many things as you can and just kind of assimilate the information to get a full picture or as big a picture as you, you can. Good questions that I, I ask people is in a more of a horticultural setting, I guess, some of these, you know, where was the tree purchased? When was a tree purchased? When did you plant the tree? How did you plant it? <clears throat> Excuse me, because some people say, well, you know, like I always do, I pulled it out of the plot, pot and I dug a, a hole that was about the size of the plot and I stuck it in and I threw some dirt on it and I walked away. 
um, you know, th there's a there's a right way and a wrong way to plant a tree, and that's the kind of the first mistake or right thing that that people can do when they when they purchase a tree. Um, then other questions are when did you first notice symptoms? Because you know, phenology uh, life cycle. Th th there's all these things that uh, that can cue you cue you into what maybe happened uh, to make the tree looking to make the tree look like it does. Um, what did the first symptoms look like? Uh, have the symptoms gotten worse? Uh, any questions about unusual weather, et cetera, et cetera? You sort of have to feel that, feel out that situation and, and ask those questions. You got to be thorough. You got to gather that information from observations as well, because landowners don't always tell you the whole story. They might be embarrassed about something that they did. Um, I've certainly been in a, a lot of situations where, you know, the truth comes out eventually, but uh, it might take a long way, long way to get there. But you got to be thorough. You got to be systematic, and you got to use all of your senses. You got to feel things, and when I say feel things, you know, you feel around the, the the circumference of of the trunk. Is there a flat side? Is the bark cracked unusually? Are there any uh, any kind of wounds or any kind of residue on the on the bark? Um, uh, you know. Obviously, you're looking at things, you're noticing things like abnormal color. You might even smell things. And I say, you know, smell thing. One example is uh, bacterial wet wood or slime flux. These are things that uh, they have an odd smell about them. And, uh, you know, that, that's another sense that shouldn't be overlooked. So you're, you're doing a lot of detective work. And I usually tell people tasting things. That's the one sense you pretty much leave out of, of this whole process because that's it's it's good. You're, the tree owner is going to think you're awful strange, and there's really not a whole lot that can be learned from uh, from tasting trees and tr tree parts. Um, so, you know, I I talk about this kind of loosely, but there's definitely an approach, and th these are four basic categories uh, of tree diagnosis, and this is pretty much borrowed from the International Society of Arboriculture, and I've I've just added some some more you know details to this so the four basic categories of observation these are the these are the four that you should sort of keep in the back of your mind when you approach a situation where you're trying to figure out what's wrong with the tree number one plant identification number two site inspection site history number three assess the pattern of abnormality and uh category four is inspect the functional parts of the tree the leaves the branches the root and root collar you do these four things and you have a pretty good chance of getting to, to where you need to be and at least be in the ballpark of what might be wrong with your tree. And at least you're going to be able to rule a lot of things out by uh, doing this process. And that's that's almost as valuable as uh, coming to the, uh, you know, the exact answer, which is not always easy. So number one, species identification is so important because most insects and diseases are specific to the host trees they attack. They're specialists. And this is a good uh, general rule um, with insect and disease. They're not only uh, they're not only specific to the species that they attack, that attack or, or use as a host. Um, they're often very specific to a certain type of tissue. You know, they're a root pathogen of maple. They're a leaf pathogen of maple. They're a main stem um, borer of maple. So uh, species. Uh, um, sort of the, the specialization of tree pests makes species identification really important. So proper identification of species or subspecies, um, and when I say, you know, that, I mean variety or cultivar, it quickly narrows down the number of possible causes. And I say subspecies variety cultivar because there are some cultivars in the nursery trade that are specifically susceptible to um, attack by certain um, you know, native insects or pathogens. Um, but the, the best uh, example I have of that is uh, the fall gold ash tree, which was a really popular um, ash cultivar in the nursery trade uh, for northern climates. It was planted very heavily in some northern U.S. cities and even more so in, in Canadian cities. And it was really susceptible to the cottony ash psyllid. Um, and uh, so much so that the cottony ash psyllid, which really doesn't cause a problem for our other ash trees, it was killing uh, fall gold ash trees in, in very large number numbers and cost, causing municipalities a lot of money. So uh, that's just one example of why 
not just species, but subspecies, variety cultivar, those are important things to know. Um, insect and disease issues are often regionally specific, so host identification is the key. So here is you know an example you got hundreds of tree diseases in the united states so i'm talking about diseases here because i'm a pathologist but you got a hundred you got hundreds of tree diseases in the united states for a particular tree species there could be about eh, you know 15 known diseases for that uh, particular species but then you add region to this you know we're in the northeast region so you narrow it down within a given geographic area there may only be two or three diseases that are really common for a certain species so, uh, you know, here's disease number one, disease number two, or let's call them disorders because that second picture is a herbicide exposure picture. And uh, that last picture is a winter burn picture. So those are disorders, not necessarily diseases. But anyway, um, so when there's two or three diseases that are common for a species in a geographic area, you've narrowed it down from 100 to two or three, and then you know you use some other, other skills and resources and you can figure out what's going on. So it's really a piece of cake. Um, number two is site inspection, or category two is site inspection. So site broadly describes all the conditions that are, uh, in a local area where a tree is grown. And it's really important because tree health and vigor are often determined by site. And tree health and vigor are very important um, they are extremely important uh, mechanisms or let's say factors of, of host resistance to um, insect and disease attack. A healthy tree is going to do much better um, fighting off bronze birch borer than a tree that's been drought stressed and is attacked by bronze birch borer like that, that birch tree on the, on the right. Uh, so site inspection also includes site factors like soil type, climate, microclimate, uh, landform. Um, so landform would be, you know, is it in a low area where maybe some salt runoff pools, for example, the moisture conditions, the disturbance hist history. And one of my favorite things is how does the lawn look? If there's no weeds in the lawn, you always have to consider herbicide as a reason that a tree is not doing well. And people use a lot of herbicide and they use it uh, improperly and carelessly and a little bit can do a lot of damage because those chemicals are specifically designed to kill green things and that includes trees. So site inspection can also include uh, uh, issues like uh, I kind of just mentioned it, uh, physical injuries or even chemical injuries. So here we've got some salts, uh, some de-icing chemicals that have splashed up against, I believe those are yew trees. I didn't take that picture. Um, and then on the right, you have some runoff from some new new construction. And the 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 water that runs off of new construction is very, it, it picks up a lot of alkal, alkaline materials. And that alkalinity can change or alter the pH at least temporarily in the soil and cause things like chlorosis or inability of plants to take up iron. So, um, you know, there's a new sidewalk there. There's a, a new building. All of that alkaline runoff can uh, cause a problem in the, the juniper on the, on that right picture. So, OK, site inspection is also about history. So many tree problems in the urban and residential environment include some, you know, let's say, you know, really poor fill that's uh, that's trucked into an area or let's say lack of, of topsoil, um, recent excavation, you know, disturbance of, of the roots, changing the grade of the soil, suffocating roots and doing that, um, digging a new sidewalk, internet cable, which is really common these days. People are getting new internet connections and they're digging around, uh, um, you know, around trees, roots and, and causing uh, damage. Um, you know, and there could also be chemical use or storage in an area. You know, maybe there was an old tractor parked next to the, the the tree for a long time that was leaking oil, or you know, brake fluid or something. Soil compaction, mechanical injuries, all of these things are uh, things that you can look at and ask about that are related to site. So the next thing is assess the pattern of abnormality, and this is really good for differentiating between biotic and abiotic factors. Uh, it's just another way that you can narrow things down. So um, damage caused by environmental and abiotic factors, non-living factors, tend to be expressed throughout the entire tree, and they tend to be expressed in more than one tree in an area and more than one species in an area. 
something like herbicide is going to kill or is going to affect all things that are green. It'll affect more than one species. Whereas, you know, like I said, insect and disease, insects and diseases are very, very species and tissue specific. So here's an example of an abiotic disorder, uh, summer flooding. These trees, there's multiple species represented here um, that are showing the same symptom of being stone cold dead. And that's because their root systems have been uh, deprived of oxygen and they have died because of that. Um, here's another similar situation. Lots of different species, all dead because of a fire that went through that little grove of trees. Um, here's a picture from my past job in North Dakota where um, they do a lot of aerial spraying uh, of crops, which doesn't make any sense to me because it's so windy out there. Um, but anyway, the, they'll come with a, a, a plane and they'll spray um, a field. And if the wind's blowing just right, it'll get into the adjacent uh, woodland areas and it'll kill a lot of different species of trees. And that's an example of that right there. Here's another abiotic uh, situation. We've got juniper, we've got a, um, sorry, I'm going, I'm going out of order. So a U in the top left and a Yugo pine in the top right, and then a juniper in the bottom uh, right, and then some sort of a poodle pine. I don't know what that is. It's, it's a pine that's been, uh, manipulated and trimmed and, and whatnot, but they're all showing the same symptom, different species. It's an abiotic problem. So damage caused by insect and pathogen pests, the biotic uh, agents of dis uh, that cause disorders, they tend to have a more sporadic pattern, a here and there pattern. Um, insects and pathogens are specialists. We talked about that. Um, the, the damage is usually restricted to a few closely related species, if even more than one species in very specific parts of trees. So that's why the damage is sporadic. Um, so here's examples of bionic uh, pests. You've got uh, diplodia shoot blight on, on the left and fire blight on a crab apple, which is fire blight's a, a bacterial disease, um, a bacterial canker uh, on, on the right hand side. Um, bionic, you have the tips of all of the uh, cottonwood trees in a certain area um, dying back. That's because they're being um, they're being killed by a poplar borer, which is a, a an insect that works uh, kind of like emerald ash borer from the top down. And uh, biotic on on the right, you've got a Cytospora canker that's killed some bottom branches of a blue of some blue spruce trees. A here and there pattern. Uh, category four is inspection of the functional parts of the tree. And so we're going to go through each of the different uh, functional parts, starting with leaves and needles. Are the leaves deformed, misshapen, cupped? Um, are there little uh, structures that are different colors that aren't supposed to be there? Are there galls or the, as the growth twisting and curling? Are there lesions on the leaves? Are the leaves miscolored? Are, are they uh, sort of bleached out like the iron, uh, the maple that's suffering from chlorosis, again, from alkaline soils in that bottom left? Are, are the leaves wilted, like in the Dutch elm disease picture with the blue sky background there? The foliage, so does it look chlorotic, wilted, curled, small? Uh, these are all indications of a uh, foliar uh, pests or pathogens. Their growths or spots in the needles. Here are some fruiting structures. So in the top left, you've got a needle that's perfectly clean. Uh, there's no fungal growth in any of the stomata, which are the, the breathing pores in the, in the surface of the needle. Whereas in, in the lower left, you've got some fungal spore producing structures that are uh, um, producing spores for infections of that particular pathogen. Um, is there reduced needle retention? So looking at growth increment, and there's a, a different slide on that, but looking at growth increment, you can see I've I've got the the years of growth mapped out on this on this twig. You've got the newest growth furthest to the right, the second year growth. Well, actually, the newest but the newest growth is going to be in the buds at the very tip of 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 that that branch, and then the growth that happened last year is indicated by Roman, Roman numeral one two years ago by Roman numeral two and so on back to uh, uh, year uh, four and in year four is not the tree's not holding on to any needles from four years ago. Um, trees with without a full complement of needles uh, have, have trouble 
really thriving. So is there reduced needle retention? Look at the blue spruce all across Maine and, and you'll see good examples of reduced needle, needle retention from uh, the needle cast diseases of spruce that are very common. Are there leaf spots or lesions? Here's a, a selection of, of lesions. You've got septorius uh, leaf spot in the upper right. Linden leaf, leaf blotch, which I've actually never found in Maine, but it's, uh, it, is a, it is one of the few foliar pathogens of our American linden or basswood trees. Um, lower right is anthracnose disease of ash, and lower left is anthracnose disease of oak. And by coincidence, I'm seeing a lot of anthracnose of maple. So it's the same kind of lesions uh, as you see here, but they're a little bit blacker. Um, I've been getting lots of calls and seeing a lot of anthracnose of maple this year in, in Maine. Insects, they're pretty, they're pretty easy to see. Um, you got dogwood, uh, sawfly in the top right, um, fall webworm, bottom left. Pear slug sawfly saw kind of looks like bird droppings on a hawthorn in the lower left, and ash plant bug in the upper left. Is there abnormal fruit? Plum pockets um, next to uh, the letter A in the top left, and then there's a gymnosporangium rust, which is, uh, yeah, I won't go into detail on that. Um, and then also uh, there's the uh, Botryosphera um, disease of apple, which is uh, mummifies the, the the fruits there in the lower lower left. So again, we're going on with inspection of the functional parts of the tree, the branches and the shoots. Are there swellings? Are there cankers? Are there exit holes from uh, native or non-native insects? Uh, sap sucker damage, like on, on the right. Um, any of these things can be indicators of why a tree is not doing well. Uh, flagging, which is a fancy or a, or, you know, a job specific word for a dead branch, a dead or a symptomatic branch that uh, um, sort of calls to you and, and flags you down and says, uh, says to you, hey, you know, there's something wrong with uh, this part of this tree. So you got Dutch elm disease on the left. Uh, fire blight, top right, and again, that Cytospora canker of spruce uh, on the bottom right. Uh, the thing that I, now that I'm a little bit more experienced, I usually check this, but on occasion I do forget, and this is an old slide, but I, it's a good good indication, it's a good example of, of how to do this and why it's important. So you can see that um, you've got two twigs next to each other um, from the same species of tree um, grown in sort of the same proximity, but one has grown in two years, you know, more, you know, almost as much as the other one grew in four years. So looking at that growth increment, you can you can see that, you know, the twig on the on the left was grown really well in 2000. And then in 2001, it really slowed down and it sort of stayed slow so you, you you can look at that growth increment and say hey did anything unusual happen around this tree you know three years ago because it's really slowed down in growth and they could say oh yeah we we redid the driveway um and uh you know the excavator dug up a bunch of roots back then or, or you know it's just a it, it's it's a way to give you a time period that you can ask about. So look at look at growth increment. And you can tell growth increment by looking like on hardwood trees, there's the uh, the apical bud scar, which is a, a bud scar that goes all the way around. It sort of encircles the twig. So you look for that apical bud scar and you, you sort of go back. You gotta be careful with species like oak because um, oaks can put on, when, when conditions are good, um, Oaks can put on a second flush of growth, and it can be a little bit confusing when you look at growth increment. But most most trees are pretty pretty good for looking at growth increment. Looking at the shoots, by looking at the shoots, sometimes you can tell when they died. So, um, Diplodia tip light on on the top uh, left, you can see there's a healthy shoot on the on the left and a dead shoot on the right, and you can see that that shoot was blighted by a fu the fungal blight. It was it was early in the season. You know that because the the, the needles um, only elongated so far before they died. Likewise, the, the frost injury on the, the spruce on the top uh, right 
uh, you can see it was right after the, the, the bud broke and that first beginning of, of the flush um, and frost hit that succulent tissue that was not ready for cold temperatures and it killed it. And so, and you know that because of, you know, what you see. Um, and then you've got a later season um, indication with the the twig on the on the bottom. It's already produced fruit, and that's uh, what was that? That's a, car a carrageena. No, it's not carrageena. What is that? I forget what shrub that is. But um, you can you can see that it had already produced fruit, and then it was exposed to the fire blight pathogen, that bacterial pathogen that I was talking about, and it killed that shoot. So. Um, you know, th this is just another piece of information you can put together when you're trying to figure out what's wrong with the tree. When did that shoot die? And now we're down to the root and root collar uh, on the main stem. So you look for cankers, you look for any kind of bleeding, any kind of liquid. You look at the roots. Of course, you, you, I've got some pictures of some roots that have been pulled up. You can't, you know, obviously that's kind of destructive sampling. You can't, uh, it's, it's hard to, um, it's hard to know what's going on unless you you unless you pull you know unless you pull that tree out of the ground and see if it's got for, for example a, a girdling root or some kind of a gall like uh, the picture with uh, the coin there um, but you can sometimes see girdling roots above ground you can see on the top left picture there that you've got uh, first of all you got some basal injuries but then you've got some some main scaffolding roots that have roots growing over them and sometimes the you know that kind of growth can really it can cut off the, the circulation from to the you know main stem from a main structural root and that that's usually pretty serious uh setback for a tree and then there's other cankers uh, like the the utapella canker and there's a bacterial canker of a of a uh, horse chestnut there in the bottom row and then on the far right there's uh, some kind of a diffuse canker on an aspen and I never figured out what that was but um, it was pretty aggressive uh, canker of, of aspen. Some more cankers you got thousand cankers of black walnut not a big issue here in Maine because we just don't have a lot of black walnuts um, and some fire bite blight cankers on an ornamental uh, hawthorn on the on the right. Okay, and sticking with root damage, you can see again, there's a better picture of the girdling root um, um, on a main structural root that, that's actually damaged as well. But you know, look at that damage and other things that might happen. Like over here with the uh, the arborvitae or or uh, white white cedar, it was planted too deep. You know, again, we go back to that uh, that point I made about planting. You plant a tree too deep or you plant it too shallow, it's, it's sort of doomed right from the beginning. You, you can't really get away with not planting a tree right. <laughs> OK, so notice symptoms and find. And note the signs, so there's a difference between symptoms and signs. So symptoms. Um, a, tr a tree can express uh, a, the same symptom for a number of different disorders, but when you compare that symptom with an actual sign, evidence of, let's say, an insect or a fungus or, or you know, some kind of um, environmental information or herbicide use history, then, then you can, th th then you have something that you can really, really trust in. You got to, you know, symptoms are, are great to notice, but if you can't pair those with a sign, you're never going to really figure out uh, the, 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 the answer to your, your questions. So signs are types of insects, are, um, types of fungal growth, anything that looks unusual. Um, OK, that kind of ended up abruptly. I think I think I must have dropped a, a, a slide or two. But anyway, signs and symptoms, I think I made it pretty clear. You got to have both to, to make that final diagnosis. And so once you've gone through this process and you've eliminated a lot of different things and you've maybe narrowed it down to two or three different possible disorders, that's when you go to your, your uh, reputable resources, your field guides, your websites that are, you know, from uh, higher ed institutions uh, that are, you know, known for their good work. I love University of Massachusetts Amherst. I use it. I use uh, some of their resources. Um, 
uh, pretty frequently. Um, I call people that I know that are, are uh, better at this than me sometimes to get a little bit different perspective. Um, and there's also some great books out there. People don't use books all that, all that much anymore, but there's some really good books from Cornell that uh, are very detailed, um, provide a lot of information, maybe too much for a lot of people, but um, they have a great large kind of coffee table book on insects and they have a companion book on diseases. Um, and for those, anybody interested in, in those, I can I can get you the titles. I, I just can't think of the, the names right now and I don't have my any copies handy. So, but uh, there's some great resources out there. Just, you know, um, choose them wisely and you should be able to get a really good idea for what's wrong with your trees. And with that, I can take a couple questions. Terry, how how long were you expecting me to go to this evening? Um, we have until 830 set aside, okay. so however long you want to is good. OK, well, I've, I've got this. I've got the second presentation. Should we hold questions until the end or should we do the questions separately? Um, I don't see any questions yet. OK. All right, I'll let people mull things over and uh, we'll move on to uh, the, oh, I forgot I've got a quiz here at the end just to sort of hammer home some of these ideas. So what's the first step of, what's the first step of diagnosing a disorder in a tree? Uh, you identify the species, right? So we've got, uh, these are not, these are not normal <laughs> species, but there's something going on with a couple different species. We got oak, we got a box elder, we got a white pine, we got a spruce, and they're all showing similar uh, issues. So you look at the site. What do we pick up here from the site? Um, anybody feel free to unmute yourself and, and holler things out. Um, what I see is a grass or a weedless uh, lawn. I see two right of ways on different sides of the trees. Um, so I start thinking, OK. Um, so we got multiple species showing similar symptoms. We're near right away. There's potential herbicide use. We assess the pattern of abnormality. It's not sporadic. It's not here or there. It's whole tree symptoms. We observe the functional parts. The leaves are strappy. The, the growth is abnormal. And sorry, the, the, so the answer to this one was there was a lot of herbicide use. It, this was near a campground and they, they had tons of poison ivy. And one day somebody decided to say that they're going to put an end to that poison ivy. And they sprayed a lot of Roundup um, in that area. And there was a lot of uh, non-target uh, hits. And again, it does not take much to uh, really, really hurt trees. Uh, OK, so what's wrong with this tree? What's the first step? Identify the species. It's a red pine. It's actually not. It's a ponderosa pine, but for this uh, for this exercise in Maine, I, I'm calling it a red pine. Um, is it normal for this species to be orange and kind of scraggly? No, definitely not. Are the symptoms expressed through the entire throughout the entire tree? Yeah, pretty much. So we inspect the site. It looks to be some kind of a lawn. It's being kept in mowed. Um, we examine the functional parts of the tree and we see down at the bottom there that there's there's a wound and that's from uh, it's been hit by lawnmowers and weed whackers uh, a few too many times and it's it's really not thriving because of that. So here what's wrong with these trees? First step. Species. We've got two species that are affected. We've got a dogwood and then we've got an aspen. Um, there are multiple species showing similar symptoms in a pretty uniform um, uniform pattern. Is it normal? Definitely not. You've got that kind of marginal necrosis on both uh, both leaves. It means like death of the leaves from the outside going in. You got some some discoloration as well. You look at the site and you notice, okay, all the trees that are dead are kind of in the same area, and all the grass is dead in that area and it looks like it's a low area where things might be um, where water could accumulate so you start asking some his, uh, some site uh, questions about site history and you find out that there used to be a big pile of road salt on the road and it drain you know dissolved and drained down in that area and made the soil so salty that the trees were really struggling so what's wrong with 
this shrub. This is a uh, this is a spirea. Uh, used to be in my front yard in in North Dakota. Um, what's the first step? We just did that. It's a spirea. It's a, an ornamental um, ornamental uh, cultivar, and it's supposed to look like that. So there's actually nothing wrong with this with this tree. Um, it is normal. It's it's been selected. This cultivar has been selected and cultivated to or propagated. Um, as uh, you know, for its color. So just because something looks a little bit off, it doesn't mean that it's it's sick. This this little shrub was thriving. It just happened to be um, a yellow cultivar. So what's wrong with this tree? We identify it as a pine, red pine. Um, is it uniform or sporadic? The pattern of abnormality. I would call it sporadic. There's a little bit of here, a little bit here, a little bit there. Um, it's just one species that seems to be affected there. We assess the functional parts of the tree and we see there's some dead tips and there's also some fungal fruiting structures on the cone scales. And that is an indication of Diplodia shoot blight of, of our two and three needle pines. Uh, again, what's wrong with this tree? First step, we identify this as, gosh, what was this? I think it's a, a pear of some kind. Um, no, it was, it was hawthorn, sorry. So you look at the symptoms, you narrow it down a little bit, you go to the functional parts of the tree and you see that you see the symptom of the leaves are getting eaten, skeletonized a little bit. And then you see this the sign that it, it looks like bird droppings, but it's actually pear slug sawfly, which is a um, it's a wasp larva that uh, feeds on leaves during its larval state. So that that ends sort of the the quiz. Um, let's hold questions till the end because I'd like to buzz through the uh, beech leaf disease um, presentation. Uh, just to get that on everybody's mind and, and um, then we can ask either and there could be very well be questions with beech leaf disease as well. So beech leaf disease. We closest known location uh, was uh, down by the Cape in Massachusetts until we found it in Lincolnville uh, last Friday, not not last Friday, the Friday before. Um, so it was confirmed in May uh, in Maine uh, at the very end of May in Lincolnville. Um, again, pre closest previous known location was in Massachusetts. So beech leaf disease, if you if you don't know what it is, you'll you'll know pretty soon. It's a, a disease that can kill both American and European species of beech. It also impacts Asian beech beeches, but not as as, as uh, bad. Um, and this is the this was the current distribution uh, map for beech leaf disease. It uh, was first detected in Ohio in 2012, so it's only been recognized for nine years, and it's already made its way into the Canadian provinces and uh, jumped across Pennsylvania to Rhode Island, Connecticut, and Massachusetts, and now it's made the hop from Massachusetts all the way to Midcoast, Maine. Um, and although it, I don't believe it's been, um, I don't believe it's been formally announced yet, but I, I think they're working on uh, getting some some samples confirmed from some areas in uh, New Hampshire. So um, it's really it's it's astonishing at how fast this particular pat pest has spread. So this is the area where. Uh, we've found it. I, I was driving all around this area today looking for samples. I had a landowner call me in hope that said uh, my, there's something wrong with my beach beach leaves. I, I looked it up on the internet. I think it's beach leaf disease. I went there and it was it sure, sure was. It was a very severe infestation of beach leaf disease. Um, and I'll show you some pictures from that in a little bit. But it's also so Lincolnville has been confirmed hope. It's been uh, confirmed that it's been reported down in Rockland and up in Belfast by one of our foresters who happened to notice it in his backyard after he heard that it might be in Maine. So um, the symptoms of beech leaf disease are banding leaves. 
Um, it's easiest to see from you know being under a beech leaf or under a beech tree and looking up into the canopy. Um, you'll see some banding, uh, unusual banding, and again, I'll show you pictures in a bit. Uh, distorted leaf growth, leathery leaves. Uh, the disease typically starts in the understory, um, affecting beech sprouts and beech seedlings, uh, and then it uh, moves up into the up, upper can canopy and the mature trees. And it does kill, or I will say, in we don't know how it's going to behave in Maine, but we do know that in Ohio and uh, Pennsylvania, it does kill some trees, but it's it hasn't been something that's been, you know, wiping trees out, for example. But yeah. Things are different here in Maine. We have a lot of beech bark disease uh, issues that they don't have. Um, I'll, I'll, again, I'll talk about that later, but. Um, yeah, next. So these are the symptoms. So you have this raised intervenal segment. So the area between veins of the beech leaf are, are raised. They kind of look blistered. Um, and the leaves are distorted. You can see in those pictures here some a little bit, hopefully better pictures. Um, you get a feel for sort of in the upper part of that the picture on on the left. Um, you can get a feel for kind of the the leatheriness and the thickness of the leaves. They do not look like uh, beech leaves are supposed to to look. Um, they almost have a rough uh, a, a rough feel to them. And they they certainly feel thick. Uh, they don't feel papery and and light like your typical beech leaf. And so when you look um, at the beech leaves from the understory, this is what the banding looks like, and it's very clear. Um, the, these are fairly heavy infestations, but uh, you can see in, in in stands that are less heavily impacted, you can see a leaf with banding here, a leaf with banding there, um, and it's uh, it's um, it. it when I first saw beech leaf disease, I thought to myself, that looks exactly like what I've seen on the internet. It was it was very, very clear to me. So you looking at these pictures and this is what you're going to see in the woods. And it's not always like that with uh, with diseases. It, it's sometimes it takes a little bit of of uh, yeah, creative thinking to to really see classic symptoms. But all, all the symptoms I've seen in Maine so far are absolutely classic. <clears throat> This is a site from from hope today where you can really see that these leaves are thick. They are they're very heavily banded. It's not just one band or, or two bands on a leaf. It's every segment is banded. And uh, th this this particular forest was really, really looking poor. And I, I have some concerns about um, the health of the future health of this this forest and hope because um, this is what the beach forest look like. So this is the first place that we went when we saw or that the, the, the landowners called us and we went. Uh, I went with a US Forest Service pathologist to the site and they said in a typical year you can't see past that first uh, beech tree because the, the, can the canopy is full. Despite these trees having pretty severe beech bark disease, they're doing well. It's a good site. Um, and you know that wall of green is decimated. Those tr the, the trees have defoliated very, very heavily, and the, tr the leaves that are left are small. And they're distorted. They're leathery, and uh, functionally, I, I just don't know if they're capable of producing or you know photosynthesizing. So a, a big stress on the trees. Um, be beach leaf disease idea at 45 miles per hour. So I was, I was, as I was driving uh, the back roads of mid coast Maine today. It kind of, and I don't know that you can really see it that well on the, on this picture, but you know you'd go by an area where you'd see these gaps in the in the roads, uh, the trees on the roadside, you know, and it's usually just a consistent wall of green. But whatever, wherever I'd see one of those gaps, you know, I'd slow down, and and sure enough, I'd find beech leaf disease. Um, so that's that's something to keep your your uh, keep on on in the back of your mind when you're driving around. Um, beech leaf disease is out there. And uh, we're hoping for more um, it's kind of heads up vigilance from the, the public, people that are interested in their trees and care about their trees. Um, that's how we've been finding beech leaf disease, which is, is really encouraging. We know we're a small shop. We've got three entomologists and one pathologist. Um, and we're the th four of us are responsible for keeping track of the health of the trees uh, throughout the entire state of Maine. So. We really heavily rely on the the eyes and ears uh, 
and the diagnostic skills of, of people like yourselves that are interested in, in forest health. So with that, I believe, oh, here we go. This is the important part of the important part. So what causes beech leaf disease? It's a really good question. Researchers are not 100% sure. So it's really, it's really hard for me to talk to people about be beech leaf disease because they ask, you know, what causes it and what can I do about it? And the answers to those two questions right now are not clear. Um, researchers have kind of come to the conclusion that um, a microscopic roundworm, uh, a, a nematode, which is a, a very infrequent uh, above ground tree pest, uh, they, they found that nematode associated with symptoms and they, they pretty much decided that yes, the nematode is is a uh, a main part of the disease complex and when I say disease complex it's not just you know one host and one uh, you know pathogen or you know insect it's it's got to be an interplay of a number of things and, and in a complex in a disease complex you can have an uh, some environmental um, environmental components you can have a nematode in, included as well and maybe a fungus or a bacteria. Uh, any of these things can be part of, of a disease complex. So right now they're looking at, yeah, the nematode is, is very likely an important part of the disease complex. It's native to Japan. Um, we don't know how it got here. Uh, and um, I was just on a research call with a group of beech leaf disease re researchers on Monday morning. And last no, when was it? Why well, anyway, not last week? And um, they they were some of them were really saying that they think that there's a bacteria associated with this. So, um, but you know, it's it's interesting and it's kind of exciting, but also sad at the same time. We've got another one of these sort of potentially devastating diseases uh, within our borders, affecting one of our ecologically very important trees, and uh, we we don't have a lot of answers. We just have a lot of questions and I'm just hoping that people figure this out as, as soon as possible. There seems to be some kind of a connection with um, bodies of water in, in beech leaf disease. So like the a heavy beach component and proximity to some kind of water. Um, those are ideas that people are, are playing around with as like associations with this disease complex. So how does it spread? Who knows? And so therefore, how do you, if you visit an area that has beech leaf disease, what do you do to make sure you're not spreading it? Uh, we tell people, to, you know, just be really careful and don't move beech wood, beech leaves, uh, um, you know, stuff, you know, trimmings from yard work or whatever. Let like, keep it all on site. Don't move it around. Um, yeah, we don't know what an organisms are even involved except for the nematode. We don't know how and why symptoms develop. So the, I mentioned the, the, the people in Lincolnville uh, that reported this to us as the first report in Maine, um, they have a path through their beach forest that they walk at least once a day, usually several times a day. And uh, they didn't notice any symptoms last year. And then this year, it the symptoms are so severe, it looks like beech leaf disease has been there for three, four years. Um, and that seems to be uh, what other states are seeing this year as well. Um, Rhode Island reported uh, and also Connecticut reported, um, they had survey plots where they were surveying for this, where they saw no symptoms last year. And then this year they've got extremely bad symptoms. Um, so, you know, maybe there's an environmental component here, something about drought or who, who knows? Um, so, like I said, or like the slide says, there's a lot more questions and answers right now, and a lot of us are kind of puzzling over it. Um, and uh, yeah, I, I'm I'm going to keep people informed in about the the latest information as I as I know it. <clears throat> so again, I, I mentioned beech bark disease, which is a different devastating disease of uh, a non-native scale insect that makes our beech trees ultra susceptible to a native fungus. Um, and you know the, the, the combination of beech leaf disease plus beech bark disease is what has me really concerned in Maine. Can, can, a, can a, beech, a beech tree that has severe beech bark disease uh, tolerate also beech leaf disease? And you know there are 
there's a very small percent of beech trees in Maine that are that are resistant to beech bark disease. But will those, you know, very valuable genetic um, trees uh, with, with that resistance to beech bark disease, if they're not resistant to beech leaf disease, we, we lose that uh, we, we lose that genetic material in our forest and the potential for having healthy beech. Um, as a as a component of our forest again is is very very much limited. So we all know that you know if you talk to talk to enough foresters. Uh, I talked to one forester after that uh, first first find, and I I I didn't tell him that we had found beech leaf disease in Maine, but I said, "Have you heard about this?" And he said, "Oh, that's that's great. You know, anything that'll that'll kill the beech thickets uh, is fine by me." Well, you know, that's that's one way to look at it, but uh, beech is a very, very important uh, uh, food source for a variety of wildlife species, birds and and mammals, bears. I was reading something the other day that when there's a when there's a good crop of beech nuts, 80 percent of black bear sows will have cubs um, when there's not a great fruit set. Um, of beech nuts, uh, only 25% of, of black bears have cubs. So that, that's just one example. And, you know, they're, they're important food for blue jays and, and uh, um, uh, roughed grouse and turkeys and, uh, um, you know, all the, all the, the rodents and such. So, um, and they also have very, uh, very nitrogen rich leaves. So they're important in nutrient, nutrient site recycling and soil development so you know and they, they also do have you know there, there are certain specific wood products that are, are preferably made out of beech um, and it's also great firewood so you know losing the species is uh, is uh, would be would be really terrible for our forests e even in its diseased state with be beech bark disease it still is valuable so I've already mentioned this you know Beach leaf disease will make efforts to promote healthy beach even more challenging, um, and that's uh, definitely a concern of ours uh, as uh, uh, forest health uh, professionals. And that is the end of the information that I wanted to share with you. Thanks for having me, and I'll uh, I'll take any questions anybody has, and I might not be able to answer them if they're about beach leaf disease again because there's so much that we don't know. Dave wants, Dave wants to know if there's know anything if there's that can anything be done for beach bark, bark beach bark disease. Beach bark disease, um, really no. Um, especially in the forest, uh, in the forest uh, environment, you know there are things that can be done for high value, um, you know, landscape beach. But in the forest environment, what we tell people to do is, you know, preserve your disease free beach. There's about one percent of beach trees. Some people say there's a higher percentage. I guess it depends where you are, but uh, you know, I on a regular basis come across in a in a thicket of horribly diseased beach. I'll find a beautiful, perfectly clean beach, the the kind that uh, you know you just don't see uh, very often, and uh, those are the ones we want to preserve. And uh, and and they'll produ reproduce clonally. Um, they'll they'll produce sexually with uh, other beech trees, and hopefully confer that resistance to other trees. Uh, but yeah, there's really not a whole lot that can, can be done in terms of preventing beech leaf disease uh, in the in the forest in Maine. Kat, do you want to unmute yourself and ask your question? Yeah, can you hear me? Yes. Great, thank you. Um, Terry, I somehow the chat is rejecting me. It says it cannot post any questions, so I don't know if maybe other people are having that issue. Um. But my question was early on in the presentation, you said that there was a difference between a disease and a disorder. And then later on, you were talking about a disease complex. Could you explain again the difference between disease and disorder? Well, I, you know, it really, it's, it's, I guess it's more semantics. Um, a, a disease is a disorder. Um, an, an insect problem is a disorder as well. Um, I guess what I was referring to there was kind of the difference between something like um, misuse of herbicide versus, uh, you know, uh, a fungal leaf disease. 
Um, but and then you contrast that with a disease complex. Again, the disease complex is is not just one thing affecting uh, a tree. It's it's a combination of perhaps more than one organism and perhaps um, environmental uh, components as well. But it could be you know, a complex is is kind of a just a a way that we we communicate that. Things are not as they're not really simple, like when you talk about a rust disease, like a white pine blister rust. You know, we call that a complex because it involves two hosts and several stages of uh, of a of fungal sp spore production. So, uh, complex is just a a way of communicating that things are not really uh, really straightforward in terms of development of disease. Gotcha. Okay. Thank you. Yep. And you know, and we we refer to you know, disease is is kind of a tricky term too because disease. Um, I'll take the 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 um, the the spruce needle casts. There's a couple. There's a couple fungal organisms that cause uh, early defoliation of spruce needles. Blue spruce and white spruce being really susceptible. Um, those. We call we call like rhizosphera needle cast. We call that as a disease on blue spruce because it causes that early needle cast. I wouldn't call it a disease on Norway spruce or red spruce because it those trees can still get the disease or they can still get that fungal infection, but it doesn't cause symptoms. It maybe causes uh, defoliation of the oldest needle ca uh, needle cla cla age classes, but it doesn't it doesn't cause defoliation of those more valuable younger tissues so therefore i, I don't call that a, a disease um so and but it's it's just pathology talk it's uh it's i can i can go way deep into the weeds with some of that stuff and other pathologists will just dis disagree with me and well um the, the yeah like i said it's mostly semantics and how people were trained to think about this stuff Bill Weary, did you have a question? Weary? Yes, Bill? <clears throat> yes, please, Aaron. Thank you very much. A couple of questions for you. Uh, one, I'm wondering whether there are any advanced signs that a vole or some insects four or five inches down under the soil are at work on a plant. I lost a nice young chestnut a couple of years ago, and when I pulled the root out of the ground, it was clear that it had been girdled down below. Mm -hmm. um, and the, the second question also has to do with the beach. And I know forest owners who work very hard to get rid of those young beach because they, they just keep propagating and propagating and they'll take mm -hmm. over a whole area. They'll prevent any other kind of regeneration. Right. And certainly the, the disease risk resistant ones, one wants to sponsor and allow to grow large. The small ones that are uh, proliferating are not going to grow larger, not going to turn out beech nuts. And frankly, I'd be delighted to kill off some turkeys and some rodents. Uh, so I'm not quite quite sure. And, and, and the small ones are not ever going to mature into anything that is going to be of any uh, value as a forest product either. So those are the two sets of questions I have. Right, so I'll address the second one first. So, you know, unfortunately, uh, the beech leaf disease uh, we, again, we don't know exactly how it's going to happen in Maine. Um, and and my, my worry is that it, it will be more severe and that we'll lose more, uh, we'll lo lose more mature trees in, in the canopy and the loss of, of the service, the services that they provide. I mean, I, 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 I know many foresters too that, that work really hard to, to limit that, uh, limit the, uh, uh, you know the beach thickets, and and it's it's very very hard to deal with, and it does uh, prevent the 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 regeneration of much more valuable trees. So um, you know if there's if there's anything positive to be said about peach leaf disease, I guess that it will kill kill off a lot of those thickets. But I worry that it's I worry that here it's it could it could be more uh, more hard on on on. Uh, the mature trees and that's my, that's my major concern okay um 
but uh, uh, as far as, as as signs, you know, I I, I have the same struggles. I, I I grow apple trees and um, not a lot, but you know, I've got I've got twenty or so that I, I try to keep track of, and um, you know, every once in a while. You know, you lose one to a vole that's that's gotten under the mulch or, or dug down and and you know has has fed on uh, on roots and girdled the tree. There's also you know apple tree borer that sometimes can get really really you know low, actually in the duff layer, and you don't see you know usually you see a little bit of sawdust coming out of uh, the base of a tree, and and you know that there's a borer in there, but uh, sometimes you just can't see that stuff that's below ground. So um, you know, I just, I try to make a point of not over mulching my trees because mulching trees gives that kind of loose, uh, substrate that voles can really tunnel in. And, you know, in the winter, that's, that's a good place for them to hang out. And then there's food right there for them in the form of your, your trees roots. Um, and I, I put tree guards on, on my trees as well when they're young and when that's, when that's practical. But, uh, yeah, as far as, you know, usually that all this stuff happens um at a time when you don't see it and then next thing you know your tree's dead yeah uh, the, the vole damage that happens in the winter you don't know that that happened until your tree doesn't leave out in the summer and you pull it and you think oh oh darn you know lost another one so i i wish there was a a, a better uh better indication of of those but unfortunately those are those are, are are situations that can only be helped by you know really visiting your trees, looking at your trees uh, on a regular basis, and doing everything you can to 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 keep the rodent populations down around your trees. Thank you. Anyone else? Well, I was kind of wondering: Are you bullish or bearish on the uh, the, the woods right now with everything that's going on? Well, you know, I was driving around today and I was looking at our pines and there there's obviously something going on with the white pines. You know, even the ones by the road that usually, you know, they get a little bit orange because of salt spray and some other things, uh, you know, you, they start to grow out of it. They don't seem to be growing out of it this year. The pines in the southwest uh, that, that suffered severe drought on those drought prone soils down in like the Sanford area, which also got a terrible hailstorm. I mean... It, today I, I was I was awful I was awful bullish but you know if you look at the forest as a, as a whole um, Maine Maine has a, a, a tremendous resource that uh, for the most part is very healthy I did I wish the I wish really you know I don't worry about the diseases and the insects so much I, I kind of worry more about the weather um, moisture like you know like I said uh, tree vigor is so important to uh, resistance to disease and insect pressure and uh, you know this this if the soil that these trees are growing in is dry um, you know they're just not going to have the full suite of of defense uh, mechanisms to kind of repel even the most basic stuff so or you know the the you know, the garden variety pests that any tree faces in a given year. So that that's my, I guess I'm most bullish uh, about the environment issues and, and trees just not getting the kind of uh, water and therefore the nutrients that they need to really be vigorous. Um, I, and, you know, ask me on a different day and I'd be more bearish about the disease issues. But this whole thing with, with beech leaf disease has, has been uh, a real wake up call and, you know, there's there's bigger there's bigger problems out there that you know could be threatening Maine's forests like like oak wilt, um, for example, uh, which is you know a pest of our of red oaks and um, it just it it really reminds or it's a good reminder that we can't be moving firewood around we can't be moving um, you know we, we got to be real careful about moving ornamentals and uh, really uh, you know that being a potential way that beech leaf disease was uh, introduced to the area. Um, you know, so, I don't know. It, it, you know, you talk to people like me and Mike and Tom Schmelk and Colleen Tierling, I and mean, we deal with this stuff all the time. So, 
Um, we we typically don't have a lot of good news to share, but that that's not to say that uh, that there's not uh, there's not reasons to be optimistic about the forest. We just really need the the weather to to cooperate a little bit better, and I think everything would look better, and we'd all feel better about it. Yeah, and I think that just kind of goes to show people need to be so careful about not transporting things from one place to another. I mean, I know people all the time who say, oh, yeah, it was down at my grandmother's house in Massachusetts, and I brought back a cutting of her her whatever bush, and yeah. I'm sure it's healthy. It looks good down there, but it may be well adapted to some sort of pest or disease down there that it will bring back up here. Mm -hmm. Bill, did you have another question? This is Kat. I actually have another question related to what you just said. Um, so if I wanted to purchase ornamental trees or ornamental shrubs from a nursery within Maine, but, you know, like, what should I be considering if I'm buying something from a nursery center and its proximity or distance from where I want to plant it, you know, I can I can easily pick up something two or three hours away, still in Maine, and then have mm -hmm. that driven to my house. And is, is it a, a distance issue or like a subclimate issue that I should be concerned about? It's more of a, I guess, I guess there's different ways to look at it, but you know, we have quarantine areas um, and, um, you know, certain nursery material should not be coming from places that have uh, certain diseases or insect issues. Um, you know, plant material should not be coming from a quarantined area to a non-quarantined area. Um, mm -hmm. And th those regulations are in place and, and we we kind of rely on more, most mostly on the honor system that nurseries you know, abide by um, by by the rules, and and I'm not. A, I wish Mike was still on the call because he's our he's our regulatory specialist, and he probably could speak more uh, more eloquently about it. But um, you know, but buying you know coming down to Manchester and going to Longfellows and buying some nice trees and driving over to like uh, Belfast and planting them, you're pro you're probably not gonna. That's probably not gonna be the issue. It's it's you know getting an oak tree from uh Pennsylvania and you know you really like it and you come and you plant it at your summer home in, in Maine and you know in the process introduce oak wilt <laughs> to oak wilt disease to Maine that's that's kind of the the transporting mm -hmm. I mean the shorter distance the better as far as I'm concerned but uh you know within within reason it's not uh we don't really have a, a mile limit it's really specific to species and whatever happens to be uh, the the disease associated with that species. Yeah. Is there is there anything that we as a consumer should be asking a nursery in advance of purchasing something from them? Or, you know, you're talking about how they are sort of self-regulating? Yeah, you know, and our, our Department of Ag is, is a regulatory agency and, and they do nursery inspections and they look for specific things. Um, okay. but, but it's really hard, you know, um, if there's some sort of an Asian beach cultivar and there's no there's no regu regulations in place right now for beach leaf disease because, well, we don't we don't know much about it. And there's no uh, federal group that's responsible for, you know, overseeing beach leaf disease and its spread and, and its impacts and things. So you know, a nursery can have, uh, you know, could potentially have a, a, a beach cultivar that has beach, you know, or the, uh, that, that, uh, that nematode in it and you wouldn't know, I mean, it could be asymptomatic and, you know, like we, as an example, there was a, a shipment of maples that came in, um, I was a couple of years back now that looked great they had no symptoms and then they started looking bad and then sure enough you know we got to, got to look at them and I, I got some assistance from the plant diagnostic lab up in orono from allison smart and she did some tests and they had a fight they had a phytophthora a root disease which you know phytophthora root disease is a pretty serious root disease and you know it it made it through all the checks uh from the the home nursery where they they have to you know where they propagate the stuff where they're super careful about 
not uh, not letting uh, d disease uh, kind of develop in, in in their plants uh, that they're sending all over the place and and it got through other inspections and just because it was asymptomatic that fungus was in there but it just wasn't producing any symptoms until it got to its final destination it's really tricky i mean uh, that's why you know I, I always tell people if you can plant plant uh you know native trees from a, a local source and uh and um try to appreciate those rather than the exotic from far away mm -hmm. <laughs> so but i mean i i, I understand people want to have the the you know the the japanese maple and the you know the other beautiful trees that are that are available but it's Well, thank you. This has been great. Well, Garrett says I had to talk a friend out of bringing plants with them from Pennsylvania. So kudos to you, Garrett, for doing that. Yeah, thank you very much. Pennsylvania has just about everything we don't want in terms of insects and diseases right now. So, um, yeah, let's keep it local and and uh, try to stem stem the flow of of any of that stuff that's coming from far away.